From Sunday sermons to our most recent Hollywood spectacles, the scenes are as familiar as nearly 2,000 years of repetition can make them. But very few in our modern world are aware that there is no historical proof that Jesus ever existed. Is the Bible really infallible, as Christians claim? The lack of evidence for Jesus begins with the many historical mistakes contained in the New Testament. Nobody knows when Jesus was born, which is very odd. The Bible story claims everyone, including King Herod the Great and the three wise men, knew the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. King Herod even directs the three wise men to follow the star. In the Gospel of Luke, after Jesus is born, he is taken to the temple and declared to be the Messiah, so Herod would have known about him right away. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Herod doesn't find out about Jesus until about two years later. The Gospel of Matthew states Jesus was born before King Herod's death, which occurred in 4 BC. Matthew also says that the family fled to Egypt to escape the Herod kings. But the Gospel of Luke states that Jesus was born during a census dated by historians to 6 AD, 10 years after Herod's death. Luke does not mention an escape to Egypt and says the family stayed in Nazareth the whole time. Matthew then says that King Herod killed off all the male infants in an entire town, hoping to murder the baby Jesus. This became known as the slaughter of the innocents. In his book, Antiquities of the Jews, the first century Jewish Roman historian Josephus lists all the crimes of King Herod. If Herod had murdered the children of an entire area to kill one infant, Josephus would have included it. Josephus doesn't mention it because it never happened. King Herod killing the infants occurs only in the Gospel of Matthew. No other Gospel mentions it. Historians of the time do not mention it. In the book, The Bible on Earth, published in 2001, the director of Tel Aviv University's excavations in Israel shows how archaeological evidence disproves the existence of Abraham and other Hebrew patriarchs. Abraham and Moses never existed. Jerusalem was only a small village in the time of King David and King Solomon. The existences of David and Solomon are also questioned. Jews and Christians call themselves the children of Abraham. When the prophet Muhammad created Islam, he declared that Arabs are also the children of Abraham. The last victory of monotheism in the Middle East occurred in 610 AD, when Muhammad combined the pagan god Allah with the Judeo-Christian god Jehovah. 
Mohammed was an Old Testament prophet from Medina, which at the time was a Jewish settlement and had been for centuries. Mohammed used the story of Abraham's maid to claim Arabs were also the children of Abraham. But even Israeli archaeologists now agree that the story of Abraham is just a story. This means that the original Hebrew religion was created by men, not handed down by God to any chosen people. Jesus, even if he did exist, could not be the only begotten son of this manufactured God. The conflicts among Jews, Christians, and Islamists continue to this day, but it is undeniable that all three religions rose from the same monotheistic source. Luke and Matthew say Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but John says Jesus was born in Galilee. And the Jews rejected Jesus because he was not from Bethlehem, from where the Messiah had to come. There are many historical inaccuracies in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments. The Bible says the high priests Caiaphas and Annas judged Jesus. But in reality, Annas was removed from the office of high priest in 15 AD. Caiaphas became high priest in 18 AD. Annas and Caiaphas never were joint priests. There never were two joint high priests. The Gospels portray rebellious acts of Jesus, such as evicting the money changers from the temple, but Josephus does not mention them. The Roman historian Tacitus states there was no disturbance in Palestine during the period when Jesus is supposed to have lived. Some of the worst mistakes concern Pontius Pilate. In Luke, Pilate sheds the blood of the Galileans and adds it to their sacrifices. This act was committed by another governor many years before Pilate's rule. After the trial of Jesus, Pilate invokes the so-called Passover practice of freeing a prisoner when he asks the Jews to choose between Jesus and Barabbas. No such Passover practice ever existed. As Jesus is whipped through the streets, the Jews are made to shout, May his blood be upon us which are exactly the words shouted during the sacrifices of previous Savior gods before Jesus. If the historical Jesus spoke alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was there to record his words? No one. The speech is meant for an audience, not the ears of God. It is physically impossible for all the events of the Passion to have occurred in the time allotted. Luke even throws in an extra visit to the king. The Jewish tribunal would not sit during the night of Passover feast, and the Jewish Sabbath is repeatedly violated. Crucifying Jesus at Passover would have broken at least seven of their religious laws. Historically, the Roman period was one of the best documented ever, but Jesus is not mentioned in history, outside of known forgeries and poorly researched fictions. The evidence instead is that the Catholic Church later went back and destroyed as much of the history of the early Christian period as it possibly could, including over a hundred volumes of the Roman historian Livy. These are the actions of someone with something to hide. Why do the four Gospels conflict on the most basic matters of Jesus' life? Because originally they represented competing schools of Christian thought. They were eventually brought together in the New Testament because some of these schools agreed that Jesus should be someone who actually lived. Up to 30 other Gospels were left out of the New Testament because their stories of Jesus are clearly fictional. The Gospels that were left out of the New Testament are now called the Gnostic Gospels. Justin Martyr was one of the leading early Christian writers who wanted to make Jesus a historical figure. Justin's writings are available in the original Greek without later changes made by the Catholic Church. In these original writings, Justin directly quotes the Old Testament over 300 times, often directly naming Old Testament authors, but he never, not even once, quotes Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Justin Martyr, who never quotes from the New Testament Gospels, does refer to these Gnostic Gospels. In his writings, Justin continually argues with the Gnostics about whether Jesus really existed. From his writings and others, historians can reconstruct the arguments of the Gnostic Christians who knew that Jesus was not originally a historic figure. Justin's original writings are proof that the four Gospels did not exist before his death in 165 AD.
Only the most ignorant of Christians today still believe that the Gospels were written by the Apostles. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia admits the Apostles did not write them. Historians document and Christian scholars admit that the Apostles did not write the New Testament. And if Jesus did not exist, the Apostles did not exist. The historical proofs most often given for the existence of Jesus are that he is mentioned by Josephus and that since there are Christians there must have been a Jesus. But hundreds of religions have worshipped someone who did not really exist. Josephus wrote extensively about other radical Jewish sects such as the Essenes. Wouldn't Josephus have written extensively about Jesus? As late as 94 AD, Josephus had nothing to say except one short paragraph that even Catholic bishops have called a rank and stupid forgery. In the forgery, Josephus is made to say Jesus was Christ, but Josephus was never a Christian. Only a Christian would make that statement. In other writings, Josephus says the Emperor Vespasian is the Messiah. Josephus lived in Rome during the time of St. Paul. The convert St. Paul was supposedly the leading Christian figure in Rome and so dangerous that he was publicly executed under the Emperor Nero. But Josephus doesn't mention Paul either, nor is Paul mentioned by other historians of the day. The epistles of Paul are some of the earliest Christian writings. But first we have to deal with more forgeries this time of Paul. The general consensus among modern scholars is that just seven of Paul's epistles are genuine. Separate these from the rest of the New Testament and it becomes clear that Paul only describes the story from the crucifixion onward and he does not know about the Gospels. He never refers to Jesus of Nazareth or Bethlehem. He does not refer to Judas, Pilate, and the other biblical characters and does not quote any of the sayings or sermons of Jesus. Many scholars note that these are actually Gnostic in flavor, like the Gnostic Gospels that were not included in the New Testament. Marcion of Pontus, a Gnostic Christian who opposed the attempt to change Jesus into a historical character called Paul, the greatest disciple of Christ. Marcion claimed to have found the epistles of Paul in Antioch and was the first to publish them in Rome. But the Paul Marcion may be referring to as the pre-Christian teacher and philosopher Apollonius of Tyana, a well-known historical figure who lived to about 100 AD. Paul was said to be born in Tarsus. Apollonius was schooled in Tarsus. Paul was said to have fought the wild beasts at Ephesus. The same was said of Apollonius. Both Paul and Apollonius speak of the altar to the god with no name in Athens. Apollonius is a Greek name which when translated to Latin becomes Paulus or Paul. Did the Catholic Church eventually hide the pre-Christian Apollonius, the true original author of the Pauline epistles, behind the name Paul of Tarsus? Martin Luther, the creator of Protestantism, stated that Apollonius was the true author of at least one of Paul's epistles. Like the Gnostic Gospels left out of the New Testament, the true epistles of Paul, or Apollonius, relate a story that is mythical, not historical. The reasons for this can be better understood by exploring the true underlying basis for the creation of Christianity, or the real Jesus. Human religion began with worship of the earth, then the sky with its stars and planetary bodies. As their knowledge grew, humans began to understand the importance of the sun for their survival. They depended on the sun not only for warmth, but for plants and crops to grow. 
Sun worship originally involved the pantheon of gods. The major figure represented the sun and the minor gods and goddesses would represent the other planets and stars or the constellations. The Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten achieved the first success in worship of the sun alone, creating what we now call monotheism. It was short-lived, but Akhenaten's separatist priests formed their own mystery school, which later came to influence the Greek sage Pythagoras. They also merged with the Babylonians, who began to turn towards monotheistic worship of one of their gods, Marduk. The Babylonian priests influenced the Judean priesthood during what is known as the Babylonian captivity. The Judean priesthood began to separate the Jewish war god, Yahweh, from the rest of their pantheon, creating what we now call Judaism. The Judeists based many of their myths on older stories from other countries like Sumer. Modern astronomers continue to validate the ancient system called the Great Year. Approximately every 2,000 years at the spring equinox, the sun begins to rise in a new constellation. The 12 constellations became the signs of the zodiac. For most of human history, astrology was considered a sacred science. When the sun rose in a new constellation every 2,000 years, ancient astronomers and priests declared the earth to be passing into a new age. In our modern times, the age of Pisces is now passing into the age of Aquarius. It takes the sun 26,000 years to rise in all 12 constellations before the cycle starts over again. Ancient knowledge of the great year is found worldwide. The sun-worshipping kings and priests began marking the passing of the ages by introducing sun gods for each new age. Sometimes the god of the passing age would have a son for the new age. The creation of monotheistic Judaism, Christianity, and Islam straddles the period when the age of Aries was passing into the age of Pisces. But as mankind's knowledge grew, he began to gain a better understanding of natural laws. The sun, moon, and stars were just objects in the sky, not gods. One of the first descriptions of the natural laws was put forward by the Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a forefather of what is now called the Gnostic movement, which eventually would play a large role in the creation of monotheism and early Christianity. The kings and priests realized that as knowledge of natural laws filtered down to the merchant classes and the uneducated, the worship of the sun would end, and so would their powers over the people. The solution was to transfer the attributes of the sun gods to mythical human figures. These figures were understood to be mythical, and their tales matched the sun's monthly and yearly progress through the sky. Many such solar heroes and savior gods preceded Jesus. Their stories are exactly the same as the New Testament story or have many of the same elements. They were born on December 25th. Their mother was a virgin. They were crucified or nailed to a tree and then buried for three days, after which they were resurrected. For just one example, let's compare the Jesus story to the Horus myth from Egypt. Jesus, born on December 25th. Horus was born on December 25th. The mother of Jesus was Mary. The mother of Horus was Isis Mary.
Jesus begins as the Lamb of God in the age of Aries. Until about the 8th century AD, crucifixes bore the figure of a lamb, not a man. <laughs> lamb imagery gave way to fish imagery to denote the incoming age of Pisces. Ancient astronomer priests noted that the sun descends southward until after midnight on December 21st, when it stops moving south for three days and then starts moving north. During this period, the sun dies, and it is hung or crucified in the sky. This three-day period is called the winter solstice. At the end of the winter solstice, on December 25th, when the sun begins moving north, the sun is resurrected or reborn as the new sun for the coming year. Ancient peoples in colder climates rejoiced and created celebrations for December 25th, the day the sun turns north, because it meant that spring was coming. The sun is born of a virgin. Ancient astronomers noted that at some winter solstices, the constellation of Virgo, or the Virgin, rose with the sun, having the sun at her bosom. This was the origin of the virgin birth myth, later applied to savior gods, including Jesus. During the daytime, the sun is highest at 12 noon. Jesus began his father's work at the age of 12. The sun enters each constellation at 30 degrees. Jesus is baptized at the age of 30. The sun's disciples are the 12 constellations. Jesus had 12 apostles. The sun changes water into wine by both creating rain and ripening the grape. The sun walks on water. The sun wears a halo. It is very easy to demonstrate that the story of Jesus in the New Testament is meant to be yet another astrological tale of the sun's passage through the year. Jesus is born between a horse and a goat, the symbols of Sagittarius and Capricorn. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, the water bearer, also the symbol of Aquarius. The first disciples were fishermen, corresponding with the symbol of Pisces. Jesus is called the Good Shepherd, corresponding to the lamb or ram of Aries. The sign of Aries was named for the spring months when the lambs were born. The Taurus sign was named for the months of April and May when bulls were used to till the fields. Jesus tells the parables of sowing and tilling the fields. Jesus speaks of duality, symbolized by the sign of Gemini. Next, Jesus speaks of backsliders, which corresponds to the sign of Cancer. Jesus is then called the lion, which corresponds to the sign of Leo. In Egypt, the sign of Leo was named for the hot months when the lions came in from the desert. Jesus is called the true vine, corresponding to the grape harvest that occurred during the months of Virgo and Libra. Jesus is betrayed by Judas, the backbiting scorpion, or the sign of Scorpio in the fall months, during which the sun's strength begins to weaken. On the cross, Jesus is physically wounded in the side by the centurion's spear. The earlier astronomical version was the arrow Sagittarius, the centaur, 
piercing a dying sun in December. Jesus is crucified and dies between two thieves or between the winter signs of Sagittarius and Capricorn. This corresponds to the sun dying at the winter solstice. Like the new sun that emerges from the solstice, Jesus is resurrected three days later. Such passion plays were performed in all of the older Savior God religions. Julius Caesar, in the century before Jesus, was declared to have been born of a virgin by a vote of the Roman Senate in order to make him a god able to compete with other pagan gods. It is easy to prove that the earliest Christians knew the Jesus tale was fictional, that Jesus was a metaphor for the sun, and that the basis for the story was astrology. St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, wrote, Should we understand sacred writ according to the letter, we should fall into the most enormous blasphemies. Early converts to Christianity were forced to recite a curse that Jesus was not the Son. Therapeutes are noted by, among others, the Jewish historian Philo. Philo said they worshipped the sun. Possibly a therapeutic himself, Philo wrote of the trial and crucifixion of a suffering servant, but he does not mention Christ or Christianity in connection with these events. Instead, Philo's work was later adapted for the initial creation of the mythical Christ figure. The therapeutes were an ancient network of religious brotherhoods. They eventually became known as the Gnostics. The 4th century AD Christian historian Eusebius admitted that the therapeutes were the same as the Gnostics. Eusebius also drew a clear distinction between the therapeutes and the Jewish Essenes. St. Paul called himself a deacon, which is a rank of the therapeutes and Luke is made to be a physician, another way therapeutes refer to themselves. The therapeutic mystery schools linked Britain and Europe through Palestine to India and then all the way to China. Their main school was associated with the great library in Alexandria, Egypt. All the solar hero and savior god myths based on the earlier sun god worship emerged along this same route. As the age of Pisces dawned, these mystery schools were called Christ schools. Modern scholars prefer to call them Jesus schools, even though it is documented that in addition to Jesus, they produced different gods in different regions. These were to be the new savior gods for the age of Pisces. Why would some of these Christ schools decide to turn the obviously mythical Jesus into a historical character? The answer lies in Israel during what is called the Messianic Age, and a conflict between two Jewish sects. Over several centuries, the Gnostic Samaritan priesthood began competing with the Hebraic Judeans. This resulted in the fabrication of a historical Jesus and the Judeans being scapegoated for his murder. Priests, rabbis, ministers, and Islamists want their followers to believe that there is only one God and that there has always been only one God. Christians, Jews, and Islamists all consider themselves children of the Jewish patriarch Abraham. But the well-hidden fact is that this monotheism does not go back forever and ever, and that the Jewish God Yahweh was originally one of a pantheon of gods. Until recently, biblical archaeology in the Holy Land was deliberately confined to producing only what might confirm the Bible and hiding the rest. But unavoidable discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls have opened the floodgates. Archaeologists are even finding physical evidence proving that Israelites originally worshipped Yahweh along with a wife or consort.
proof that the people of Israel once worshipped their own pantheon of gods is contained in the Bible itself. The biblical words Elohim, Baalim, and Adonai refer to plural gods, no matter how many religious translators try to hide them behind a singular word, Lord. The pantheists were strongest in the northern kingdom of Israel and became known as Israelites. There were a number of gods and goddesses in this pantheon. One of the gods was named Shaddai. The sixth chapter of Exodus is used to replace the god Shaddai with the later god Yahweh. The Baal gods mentioned in the Old Testament were worshipped by some of the Israelites. In this passage at Hosea 2.16, the Old Testament writers forcibly change Baal worship to Yahweh worship. The most high god of the Elohim was El Elyon, or the sun. Among the Israelites, his priesthood was called the Order of Melchizedek. These priests worshipped other gods descended from Elyon, including a god called Moloch, who for a time was considered the same as Yahweh. Moloch worship included human sacrifice, which survived in parts of Israel until it was finally banned under the Roman Emperor Hadrian. The religious beliefs of the northern kingdom of Israel sometimes clashed with those of the southern kingdom called Judah. By 600 BC, the Babylonians began conquering the area, forcing the southern Judean priesthood into what is now called the Babylonian captivity. Many blame this loss on being punished by the jealous god Yahweh. When they were allowed to return to Israel, the exiled priesthood demanded Yahweh be worshipped above all other gods. The northern priests who had remained in Israel were mostly Samaritans who called themselves the original Israelites. The Samaritans and other sects who had previously worshipped Moloch and other gods were finally subjugated by the Judeans in 104 BC. They were forcibly converted to Judaism, but resentments lingered among the northern Samaritans mostly centered in Galilee. The Samaritans grudgingly accepted the rule of the Judeans and later united with them against the Roman occupation. But the Samaritans also began to compete with the Judeans over which Jewish sect would produce the Messiah. To the Samaritans, this Messiah would not only conquer Rome, he would also, as one Samaritan sage put it, destroy the wicked Judean priests of Jerusalem. The Jewish uprisings against Rome brought about the first Roman sacking of Israel in 66 AD. A smaller revolt brought the Romans back in 132 AD and a final victory by 135 AD. The period from 66 AD to 135 AD saw what is called the Diaspora when the surviving Jewish sects were ejected from Palestine. It is somewhere between 66 AD and 135 AD that the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried to preserve Jewish sectarian traditions and high treasure from the conquering Romans. It is also between 66 AD and 135 AD that the escaping Samaritans began joining the Therapeutan Christ schools in Alexandria, Antioch, and Rome. We know this because many early Christian fathers, such as Justin Martyr, are identified as Samaritans. The Dead Sea Scrolls, buried during the Roman purges, were rediscovered between 1947 and 1956. If Orthodox Christian dating is correct, Jesus was crucified at least 30 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried. But it's also possible the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried up to a century after Jesus was supposedly crucified. The Dead Sea Scroll documents do not contain any explicit references to Jesus or the Gospel story. They should be full of arguments about whether Jesus was really the Messiah. 
especially of Christians, an offshoot of the Jewish religion, had become so troublesome in the Roman world that Nero had to execute St. Paul in 64 AD. Instead, the Dead Sea Scrolls do not confirm any established movement called Christianity. The Samaritans and the Judeans were equally upset that no Messiah had come to save them from the Romans. But while the Judeans continued to wait for the Messiah, a document found among the Dead Sea Scrolls helps to prove that the Samaritans decided to create a spiritual Messiah in place of the one who did not come. The Messiah they invented eventually did conquer Rome, but by a path no one could have imagined. This document is called the Last Jubilee. We have already seen how the Samaritans had at one time worshipped different gods than Yahweh. This worship generated the priestly line called the Order of Melchizedek, which endured into Roman times and conflicted with Judaism. The last Jubilee document was written by Samaritans and describes the Messiah to come. The last Jubilee states that the Messiah would come from the Samaritans, not the Judeans. The Last Jubilee also states that the Messiah would be of the priestly line of Melchizedek and calls him Melchizedek Redivivus. In the New Testament, the Epistle to the Hebrews specifically states that Jesus was of the priestly line of Melchizedek. So why are Christian authorities not jumping for joy and spreading the word that the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm Jesus as the Messiah? The biggest problem is that the last Jubilee document was buried too late. Why bury the last Jubilee if the Messiah had already come? The last Jubilee document, written by Samaritans, and left at Qumran as late as 135 AD, is still looking ahead to the Messiah. In fact, in the last Jubilee, the Samaritans authored a blueprint for a Messiah. It was Samaritans, like Justin Martyr, who gradually took over the Christ schools of the Therapeutin Network. It is at this very moment, to the consternation of modern historians, that the Therapeutin Network simply disappears from history. But did it really just vanish, or did the long-established network simply transform into the Christianity it was in the process of creating? It wasn't long before the Samaritans began fighting among themselves. Some remained intensely anti-Judean. In arguing over the story, they wanted Jesus to have existed during the Messianic age so that the Judeans could reject him and be scapegoated for his crucifixion. Others, like the Gnostic Marcion of Pontus, sought to keep Jesus a merely spiritual figure who appeared on earth to argue against the Judean law and lead the competing Samaritan Israelites to salvation in true Savior God fashion. The Samaritan Marcion of Pontus is possibly the most important figure in the true history of the formation of Christianity. Studies show that Marcion's New Testament was the first, published in Rome about 140 AD. It was published before the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, John, and Luke, which used Marcion's Gospel for source material. The Jesus of Marcion's Gospel, called the Gospel of the Lord, is entirely non-historical. In Marcion's Gospel, Jesus is not even born, 
but comes down at Capernaum to argue against the Judean law. The church father, Tertullian, said, according to Marcion, Jesus Christ emanated from heaven. It is certain that the Lord or Christ of Marcion is entirely non-historical. He has no genealogy or Jewish line of descent, no earthly mother, no father, no mundane birthplace of human birth. Marcion referred to Paul as the greatest disciple of Christ. Remember our problem of Paul, whose original writings are most likely those of Apollonius of Tyana. The Gnostic Apollonius considered himself a disciple of Pythagoras. He was a member of a long-lived society created by Pythagoras centuries earlier. Apollonius is said to have found the stories of the Hindu god Krishna in Singapore and adapted them for a gospel of his own. Marcion found this gospel, which he called the Gospel of Paul, at the Christ School in Antioch. He adapted it for his New Testament. It was published first in the Samaritan language and then translated into Greek and Latin. What was in Marcion's New Testament? The Gospel, no acts, no revelations, and just one Gospel. The Apostolicon, ten of Paul's epistles. The argument of Christian authorities is that Marcion's Gospel came later, and he simply removed the historical references from the four Gospels in the New Testament. But they are reversing the truth. Remember our problem of Justin Martyr? Justin Martyr and Marcion of Pontus were the primary Christian opponents. If Marcion had taken the already existing Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John and revised them, Justin would surely have called him on it, but Justin never mentions this. Instead, Justin's original writings show that he is not aware of any four Gospels written by Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. In referring to the Jesus tale, Justin distinctly states he is quoting from a text called Memoirs of the Apostles. These quotations often differ widely from what is in the New Testament. Justin also refers to the Gospel of Nicodemus. Justin mentions the Gospel of Peter, but never refers to Peter as the founder of the church in Rome, where Justin lived and wrote. Justin quotes from the Old Testament 314 times, and in 197 of them he names the particular book or author. But like the other earliest Christian writers, Justin never once quotes from Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. This is the only proof needed to show that it was Marcion's Gnostic Gospel of Jesus that was first and the historical elements were added to Marcion's story by the authors of Luke, Mark, Matthew, and John after Marcion's death in 160 AD. For example, where Marcion has Jesus come to Nazareth, Luke adds the words, where he was brought up. But Nazareth did not exist during the time period portrayed in the Bible. Josephus extensively mapped his homeland and does not mention Nazareth, but he mentions the nearby Joppa, where Josephus actually stayed for a period of time. Archaeological digs have shown that Nazareth was built on the remains of a cemetery. Other evidence shows that Nazareth did not exist until much later. It was purposely built and settled by monks from Mount Carmel to create an attraction on the pilgrimage route used by Christians visiting the Holy Land. It was only a year after Marcion's death that a Christian council was held at Alexandria, Egypt in 161 AD. This council ratified the incarnation of Jesus. Those who did not choose to believe in a historical Jesus were condemned as heretic. This was the first step in the hostile takeover of the Christian franchise built by affluent bishops like Marcion, who had built popular Gnostic churches in Italy, Egypt, Palestine, Arabia, Syria, Asia Minor, and Persia. Marcion's Gospel was then revised four times by the authors of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, both to turn Jesus into a man who had lived and to condemn the Judeans for his murder. 
Papias, an early Christian bishop who died in 140 AD, is often quoted so that it appears he knows of the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. If so, his extensive works were important and should have been preserved, but they were not. All we have are secondhand references from Christian bishop Irenaeus in the 2nd century AD and the church historian Eusebius in the 4th century AD. According to them, Papias speaks of a Gospel of Mark, but Papias also says Mark used the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter did not mention Pilate. It can't be the Gospel of Mark we have now. Papias refers to Matthew as the author of the sayings of the Lord. This is a completely different work from the Gospel of Matthew, although the Gospel of Matthew quotes from it. The sayings of the Lord are actually a collection of translations from previous Savior gods and mystery schools. What Christian apologists also don't mention is that both Irenaeus and Papias claim Jesus lived to a very old age. To them it was blasphemy to say that Jesus was crucified at about 30 years of age. The Roman historian Pliny the Younger is said to have mentioned troublesome Christianity in a letter to the Emperor Trajan in 110 AD. But just 24 years later, in 134 AD, the Emperor Hadrian refers to these same Christianity as followers of the Egyptian god Serapis. Serapis had his own temple in Alexandria. Serapis is one of the many cult gods whose priests were competing for the Christ title and supremacy over all other religions. By the end of Hadrian's reign in 138 AD, the population of Alexandria was about 50% Jewish, including the Samaritans. This is how the religious struggle between the various Jewish sects first moved out of Israel into the rest of the world. Ignatius was among the earliest of Christians who argued for a Jesus who had really existed. Like Justin Martyr, Ignatius never refers to or quotes Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. Ignatius is the first to mention Mary's virgin birth and Pilate, but does not mention Joseph or the miracles. When fully examined, the evidence of Papias and Ignatius confirms that the overall gospel story was still being manufactured by the time of Papias' death in 140 AD. In addition to making Nazareth Jesus' hometown, Luke adds other elements trying to turn Jesus into a historical figure. Marcin wrote, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be put to death and after three days rise again. Luke adds, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes. The author of Luke admits there were many versions of the story before his. The Gospel of Luke was specifically addressed to Theopolis who some scholars believe to be the Christian bishop of Antioch between 169 and 177 AD. The identification is based on Luke's calling Theopolis Kratistos, a word for men of prominent rank or office. In 180 AD, over a century after the crucifixion, Theopolis was the first to actually put in writing the names of the four gospel authors. The Gospel of Mark is sometimes dated to 64 AD. This is because scholars believe the author is writing before the first Roman destruction of Jerusalem. But in the earliest manuscripts, the author makes clear mistakes on the geography of Palestine. These geographical mistakes are not corrected until the King James Version. Given such mistakes, the writer of Mark could not have ever actually lived in Palestine. Mark begins his story with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a mythical hero of the Nazarene faction and was added to include them in the new religion. Josephus mentions John the Baptist, but this appears to be yet another forgery.
scholars believe that Mark's original language was Latin and that he was a Roman convert rewriting the Latin version of Marcion's Gospel. The authors of Luke and Matthew used the Greek version of Marcion's Gospel. Church fathers Irenaeus and Jerome admit that the author of John was writing in opposition to the Gnostic Christian Serinthius, who was popular beginning in 145 AD. Scholars believe that John and Matthew were written to elevate the Roman Church above the others and take away the authority of the Gnostics. The author of John also makes several damaging mistakes. He names cities that never existed and makes errors in Judean geography and history. Unlike the other Gospel writers, he places most of the action in Judea and Jerusalem, not in Galilee. Worst of all, the author makes a colossal geographical mistake about where John himself was born. John was claimed to have been born in Bethsaida, which the Gospel places in Galilee. In reality, Bethsaida was never a part of Galilee. The author of John even admits he is writing propaganda for the purpose of building faith. In addition to supplying the false accusations against Herod, Matthew is the only gospel in which Jesus appoints Peter as the head of his church. Peter was not associated with the Roman church until the end of the second century AD. This is why early Roman writers like Justin Martyr never refer to him as the father of their church. The gospel of Matthew can be shown to have been written by someone educated at the college in Alexandria who is not familiar with the geography of Palestine. In fact, most of the geographical mistakes in the New Testament occur because the four Gospel authors appear to have sifted not only the words of Josephus for material, but also the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the ancient Greek version of the Old Testament. In drawing such material from the Old Testament, the authors of the Gospels mistakenly used names for cities and other areas that were either already mythical or had not existed for centuries. The author of John is claimed to be the author of the book of Revelation. Many original Christian sects rejected Revelation outright. The church historian Eusebius also disputed it, claiming it was not written by John. Revelation is originally an ancient Jewish text. It relates a year of 360 days, as does Genesis. False tales of early Christian martyrdom trace back to a passage supposedly written by the Roman historian Tacitus, in which he accused the Roman Emperor Nero of killing a great multitude of Christians in 64 AD. But no Christian apologist mentions this passage by Tacitus until the 15th century AD, leading historians to believe this entire work of Tacitus, called the Annals, is a much later forgery. Tacitus does not mention Christians in his more famous works, no author in Roman times makes any reference to or quotes from the annals. Eusebius, in his work, The History of the Church, states that no emperor ordered persecution of Christians until about 250 A.D. In 240 A.D., church father Origen admitted that few had died for the faith and that they were easily numbered. In about 178 A.D., the writer Celsus attacked Christianity in his work, The True Doctrine. According to Celsus, the cult of Christianity is a secret society whose members huddle together in corners. But the claim is that the Christian religion spread like wildfire. 
How large was the Christian church in Rome by 250 AD, two centuries after Jesus was supposedly crucified? The historian Gibbon estimated that in 250 AD in Rome, among a population of over a million, only about 50,000 were Christians. Gibbon shows that the Roman church consisted of only one bishop, 46 presbyters, 14 deacons, 42 acolytes, and 50 readers, exorcists, and porters. Christianity really only began to take hold when it made inroads on the Roman aristocracy. The Emperor Constantine saw the benefit of monotheism and consolidated the Roman Empire under Christianity at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, one of the first attempts to merge the many different Christian sects with the many pagan religions of the time. Despite this, Constantine himself remained a follower of Saul Evictus, or the Sun, although it's claimed he converted to Christianity on his deathbed. From Constantine onward, remnants of Gnostic Christianity were driven underground. The new Orthodox Christianity was propagated across Europe and Asia Minor by the sword. In 391 AD, the Great Library at Alexandria was destroyed by the Christian leaders in order to erase Christianity's origins. This was also the beginning of the Christian forgeries and alteration of historical texts, which had come under total church control. Pagan holidays became Christian holidays. Christian churches were built on the sites of pagan temples. Vatican Hill belonged to the god Mithra until 376 AD, when a city prefect suppressed the cult of the rival savior Mithra and seized the shrine in the name of Christ. The Archbishop Christostom boasted of this destruction. Some of the Gnostics were bribed into the Orthodoxy with invitations to high positions in the new church. St. Augustine was originally a pagan who converted after the councils in Nicaea. Finally came the notorious Inquisitions beginning in 1184 AD. There is no historical mention of any of the holy sites in Jerusalem being Christian before 326 AD when the Roman Emperor Constantine sent the Christian bishops and his own mother Helena to the Holy Land to find, or as it turned out, invent, the sites described in the New Testament. That these holy sites are of much later date can be proved by examining the writings of the earliest Christians. No early Christian writer states a desire to visit Jesus' hometown of Nazareth or any place that Jesus preached. No early writer longs to see Calvary or the tomb where Jesus miraculously rose from the dead. After the sacking of Rome in 410 AD, the Catholic Church gradually assumed total secular power. The power of the church became equal to or even above the power of royal families. During this time, the average Christian was not allowed to even read the Bible on pain of torture and death. Only the priests and bishops were allowed to read the original Latin and pass their version of the word on to the Christian followers in the form of sermons. This lasted until the 16th century AD and the Protestant Reformation, when anti-Catholic Christians risked their lives and began printing the Bible in common tongues such as English and German. It was only then, well over a thousand years after the supposed crucifixion of Jesus, that the many discrepancies in the Bible began to be recognized. At the end of the New Testament, Jesus is made to say, I will be with you until the end of the world. But the correct translation of the Greek should be, I will be with you until the end of the age. Currently, the age of Pisces is passing into the age of Aquarius. The long calendar of the Mayans may mark the actual date of this passing from Pisces to Aquarius as occurring on the winter solstice beginning December 21st, 2012. Are we already seeing a refinement of Christianity for the New Age?
or will world geopolitical events be made to fulfill the Armageddon blueprint and the ultimate destruction of Christianity because Jesus, who never existed, cannot return? If much of our society is destroyed in a war or natural catastrophe, what new gods will the elite survivors impose as they emerge from their underground bunkers and sanctuaries? In the dark ages, such knowledge as the earth being round, circling the sun, and the astronomical origin of all of mankind's religions had to be suppressed from the masses to protect the power of a few. Such suppression of the truth continues, otherwise the fraud that is at the center of Christianity's creation would become known to all, which is that the story of Jesus in the New Testament is actually that of the Son and that Jesus did not exist.